It is. Good morning, First Church. I love that. That sounded great. If this is your first time here, we are so glad you've come to worship with us this morning. Um, It's going to be a beautiful morning of worship to our God today. Um, I want to remind you, if you didn't get a communion element on your way in, there are baskets on either side of the auditorium, either right here inside or on the outside, and you can grab one. If you want to raise your hand, we will make sure that you get one um, anytime from now until our communion service. This morning, I want to invite Katie Fama up. She is going to read scripture and pray for us as we begin off this amazing service. So if you would, in reverence to the Lord, let's all stand up together while she reads and prays. Good morning. So I couldn't pick one, so I have three verses this morning. We're going to do uh, Matthew 6, 31 through 34. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the pagans eagerly pursue all these things, yet your Father in heaven knows that you need all these. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's pray. Abba, thank you for this day. Thank you for time to come together and worship and to acknowledge you. I pray that you would bless our time together as a community. I pray that you would open our hearts and our ears to your word and your spirit. Help us to have a good day and bless Pastor Ben. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's get excited this morning to worship our God and be thankful for the power that lives in us today. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my Hey! 
I want to read to you scripture from Psalm 145 to praise God by his words this morning. I will extol you, my God and King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on the wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Let the King of my heart
get us through the days and that can be our perfect steadfast anchor god we love you and we thank you for providing for us for keeping us safe but most importantly for loving us to the point of death that you sent your son because you wanted to have a relationship with us and spend eternity with us god that's so mind-boggling to me because we just we just feel so small sometimes and we sometimes can feel so worthless lord but I'm so glad that when we look to you and we look to your word, we can find that strength, we can find that purpose, and we can know that we are worthy because you have called us to be your children. God, and thank you. Thank you for that inheritance and that we know that we are yours and that you are the good and perfect Father. God, we hope that everything here this morning and all the days of our life are glorifying and pray and are praising to you. Lord, we love you so much, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Brianna, and this is my youngest daughter, Ava. And we're going to uh, share the communion thought with you this morning. So if you haven't got your communion element out, please do that. When I was a young child, um, 
I had a very focused sense. I could sit down and study. I could sit down and read an entire book. Um, didn't lose my train of thought. I could focus in school. And that carried all through my 20s. And then I started teaching. And for my fellow teachers in here, um, something happens when you get into a classroom with kids every day. And my focus is gone <laughs> completely. Um, it's something I've really struggled with the last few years. Um, my girls have asked me, Mom, why do we have to move to the second row in the sanctuary? And it's totally because I can't focus anymore. Um, when I do my Bible study in the morning, I have to do it before every bit, everybody gets out of bed. And I will set a post-it note beside of me so when random thoughts pop in my head, like what I'm doing at school, I can write it down and refocus on what I'm doing. So I've had to retrain myself to focus over the last few years. Um, so in times like this, when, it, when we need to have that focus, I have to really work on myself. I have to put everything out of my mind. I have to put down that testing is this coming week. I have to put down all of the things that I need to get done at my house before tomorrow morning. I have to put all of this stuff down and I have to completely focus on Jesus and what he did for us. So Ava's going to start um, reading a passage of scripture. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be reading from 1 Corinthians 11 starting in verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. So at this time, I want you to take out your bread. And I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to shut out everything that is going through your mind about this week. All the to-dos and and everything that you're worried about. And I want you to focus on Jesus giving his body for us. Take the bread in remembrance of that. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In the same way with your juice, I want you to shut everything out, and I want you to think about the sacrifice he made for us on the cross. Jesus, we just ask that you clear our minds this morning of, of all of the things that are going through our head, um, all of the tasks that we have to do, um, what the week ahead has for us, all of the trials and tribulations that, that we have going on. And Jesus, I just pray that you will help us focus in on the message that Ben is bringing us this morning. We know there's something in it for all of us. And Lord, I just pray that you are able to help us focus in on that and uh, take what we need and apply it to our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. I wasn't too nervous about getting up here until right beforehand Ben texted me and said, make sure you keep this concise. And then he followed it up with uh, in person telling me he has some incriminating pictures of me. So I'm afraid there might be a countdown. If I go too long, they're going to pop up here. So I'll talk fast. And then Cal said he asked me if I was going to cry up here this morning. And I said probably. So two challenges I have to fight here. But um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kevin Beck. Um, I've been a member here at First Church since I was like three years old. And um, when I was 16, I joined 
the worship team. I was playing bass like my son was playing this morning and have been doing that ever since. And then about 12 years ago, I became an elder here at First Church and have been doing that ever since. And I don't say those things to brag at all because I'm really nothing here. I'm just trying my best. But, um, and you know, there, there's so many people here who do things on a weekly basis or a daily basis that we don't even know about. And they don't have titles associated with that. There's men and women here who do so many things behind the scenes and they're not looking for a spotlight. They're not looking for any kind of worldly recognition. And if, if you're one of those people, thank you so much for all that you do here at First Church. And um, I also don't say my past to brag because if, if this is your first time here, you are every bit as welcome and wanted and needed and loved as someone who's been here their entire life because this place is a hospital. It's not a country club. This is a hospital for those who are in need of healing. And guess what? We're all in need of healing, every one of us, whether we've been here our whole lives or this is your first time here. So, And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about real quickly is why I brought up the worship leading and or worship team and being an elder is that I get a unique perspective on the church. Like I've been up here 30 years and I watch people walk in the doors with smiles on their faces and everything's great and hey neighbor how you doing? Yeah it's great and the worship starts and then this facade kind of starts to break down and people start the, the look on the face has changed, and it's either in complete worship to God or it's complete brokenness, or it can be both. We can be in a state of brokenness and be worshiping God. That's usually where he likes us the most. And so, and then in the elders, we often get to hear stories about things going on behind the scenes in people's lives that don't necessarily make it to this room and don't need to make it to this room. But... You win, Cal. There's, we see people hurting, and there's a group of guys in this room who loves each and, the one, each and every one of you dearly. And when you hurt, we hurt, and we pray for you guys. And, and the fact is, we're a family. We're a big family here. And the truth about families is they can get messy sometimes. Things can get ugly, and things don't always work out the way we want. But we're still a family. And because we are a family of God, God's in control of all of it. And, and the point I want to make is that God remains faithful through the good times and the bad. When people are hurting or when we're on cloud nine, God is in the middle of all of it. And he is so faithful to us. And as we come to this time of offering, I just want to ask, where's your faith in return to that? God is so faithful to you. Are you faithful to him? Do you show that in your finances? Do you show that in your resources, your time, whatever you have? You know, we, we always come up here and talk about offering like it's a financial thing, but it's, it's a much bigger thing than that. If you're only giving because you feel like it's a responsibility thing, don't do it. Ben's going to kill me for saying that, but, but don't do it. Give from your heart. Because there's not a limit on that. Just give from your heart. And the other thing is, if you see that God is faithful in your lives, how are you showing others through your daily walk, through your other resources, through your time, through your love? And so as, as we go into this time of offering, I just ask you to consider those things. There are three ways to give. Um, there's a little computer you can type in, FCC Grayson, or you can use your phone and text it or you can mail it in. Um, just uh, as, we, as we think about giving, I just ask you to not stop it with, just here's my responsibility. Give from your heart in all things. Let's pray. Dearly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for being in your house. Um, Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us, to give us that hope that can only come through that. And God, we just 
thank you for your faithfulness to us. And in, re in return, we give our lives to you. And we pray that you will accept that with, uh, with an open heart. I pray that you be with Ben in this moment as he, as he brings the word. Thank you most of all for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. He was about 22 seconds away from me coming out here with the shepherd's hook. So, I mean, but he, he made it. <clears throat> he made it. Uh, and really wasn't even close till he said, don't give. If you don't, you know. The, no. um, welcome. Hi, how are you? We good? Okay, all right. All right. If you're visiting here with us for the first time this morning, my name is Ben James. I'm the lead pastor here. We are, uh, we're, we're really honored and glad to have you with us here on this Family Sunday as we have our kids joining in worship with us, not only uh, up, you know, out in the, the, the congregation here, but also up on the stage. It sounded wonderful this morning, guys. Thank you so much for that. And Ava, scripture reading, it was uh, an amazing thing. Uh, today, we are continuing with our That Same Spirit study. We're looking at uh, the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit and its role, uh, the, the role that Holy Spirit has in our lives and uh, the impact that it not only has on us, but the world around us. And we're going to look today at the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, whenever you think gifts of the Holy Spirit, that's one of those more divisive things amongst the church world. It's controversial. It's polarizing. There are people on one side or the other side, and there's very few times that you actually get something that kind of is biblically down the middle. And, you know, a couple weeks ago, I said that Holy Spirit kind of reminds me of that crazy family member that you have that shows up at like family functions, you know, like the crazy aunt, the crazy uncle, that you absolutely love seeing but you're always kind of on edge because you never really know what they're going to say. You never really know what they're going to do, right? Do you all, does everybody have one of those in your family? Okay, if you don't, then you may, <laughs> it may be you. All right, if you can't think of anybody in your family, it's like, no, I don't know of anybody like that in my family. Yeah, chances are it's probably you. But anyhow, I mean, I think Holy Spirit kind of is like that in, in the way that we view God's Trinity. You know, it's like God the Father, yeah, we're good with that. You know, Jesus the Son, yeah, we're good with you. Holy Spirit, so, ooh, okay. Okay, what's, I don't know what's going on with that. And then as we look at the gifts, there are three times that gifts are mentioned in the New Testament. I mean, they're, they're mentioned more than that, but there's three kind of categories of gifts that are mentioned in the New Testament. Paul talks about all of them. In Romans chapter 12, he says that there are gifts of God. And we look at these gifts of God because in that passage he says, if, uh, if you have the gift of teaching, then teach. If you have the gift of declaring God's goodness and his word boldly, then do that. And, and we get on board with these things and we're like, yes, yes, gifts of God, I love that. And then we get to Ephesians 4. And we see gifts of Christ. Paul talks about the gifts that Christ gives to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers that do the work of the ministry or to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And we're like, yes, gifts of Jesus. That's fantastic because we want to do the work of the ministry. Help us if we're not gifted in these to do these. So gifts of God, yay. Gifts of Jesus, yay. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Ooh. Okay, now we're getting a little weird. Because, you know, that's, that's when, you know, the televangelist stuff starts coming in, right? That's when people start spelling Coca-Cola really fast. You know, it's, it, these, these gifts kind of weird us out a little bit. Well, I want to take just the first few moments before we get into, first, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, you can be ready, you can turn there. I just, I kind of want to share with you as quickly as I can my journey and my experience with gifts of the Spirit and being in different atmospheres, different cultures, different uh, doctrinal and theological stances on this in my 20-some 20, 20 years now of ministry. And I kind of want to share with you where God has brought me from the, the, the journey that he's had me on and now to this day to where I am as, as the journey continues. So I was raised in a church 
that believed very strongly in the sufficiency and the sovereignty of God's Word. That God's Word was all sufficient in our lives. And that's what we base the foundation of our beliefs on. That's where we turned to when we needed answers. When we went to uh, Jesus, when we were asking Him of things, we asked Him to reveal things in His Word, and everything was exposited from God's Word. It was presented in context. And that's the foundation I have. And I praise God for that because that's an important foundation to have. Amen? Like with the sufficiency and sovereignty of God's Word being God's Word. So that's how I was raised. And there was a lot of things. 1998 was a banner year for me. Okay, that was a real banner year for me. First, foremost, and most importantly, I married my beautiful bride. And here in a couple months, we're celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary. Right? Right? Listen, woman's a saint. She's put up with me for 25 years. All right? So that happened. And in this process, I was also introduced to a man who was part of my wedding that I got to meet for the first time, who played a role, did, did a portion of our ceremony, and I was able to meet him for the first time, and I had no clue at that point how this man would impact my walk with Jesus Christ. And I'll return to that for just a moment. So I've given you kind of an idea of how I was raised. Kim was raised in the church of the Nazarene. And we found ourselves being called by God and led by God to a Pentecostal church. Talk about eye-opening, right? Okay. So I want to tell you a little bit about the, my journey from that point on because I may not have the most diverse denominational background in the room this morning, but I think I'm probably in the top three. All right, so I feel like God's had me on this journey to bring me to this place where I am today. So we get to this place that's full of, of men and women, brothers and sisters who love the Lord with all of their heart. And I'm seeing things that I've never seen before. I'm experiencing things I've never experienced before. Some of them are freaking me out, but at the same time, while I'm being freaked out, there's an authenticity that I'm feeling to some of this, and I'm trying to reconcile this in my heart. So we begin on this journey together, both of us growing in this atmosphere of where there's still a heavy value on God's Word and the sufficiency of it, but there's this new element that's being introduced to us called the gifts of the Spirit. And I'm like, huh, this is weird. This is intriguing. And okay, all right, let's see where this goes. So we spend these next few years in this same vein. I begin to pastor, we begin to serve in this, uh, in this body, in this organization. And, and again, as I progress through this, Please understand that nothing I say do I want to reflect negatively on any of the brothers or sisters that we pastored, we're in church with, we're in fellowship with, because every one of them that come to my mind that I can remember loved the Lord with all of their heart. And they had an authentic, genuine relationship with Jesus. Okay, so I just want to make sure that that's out there. But my first real example and this encounter that I had with uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and those really being outplayed was I was at a men's conference in North Carolina. All right? And I'm standing there, and at the end of the service, they're having this altar call, and like these guys are praying for other guys, and they're falling flat on their backs. And I mean, and then all of a sudden, after a few minutes, I turned around and I'm like, I'm the only person standing. Like, other than the people that are praying for people, I'm the only person standing. So, you know what that makes me? A numero uno on their hit list. Like, right? I'm here. Everybody's down. There's one dude standing there. And I'm like. <laughs> so, like, they all converge on me in this moment. Kind of freaking out. Not going to lie. Kind of freaking out. And they start praying for me. And in my head, I'm praying too. And here's the prayer. Honestly, I'm like, listen, Holy Spirit, if you want to do that to me, I'm open. All right, I'm game. If truly, if Holy Spirit, if you want to do it, because we see that scripturally. Like in the Old Testament, we see when they dedicated the temple, it said that the presence of God settled into the temple in a, in a cloud, in a haze that was so heavy that the people couldn't even stand up underneath the weight of it. 
Like so the presence settled in and they lost all power to be able to hold themselves upright. So I'm like, Holy Spirit, if you want to do that to me again, great, I'm fine with that. We see in Acts chapter 4 where the Holy Spirit shows up and the foundation of the building actually shakes. Like we're talking about Holy Spirit here who can do this kind of stuff. So I'm like, Holy Spirit, if you want that to happen to me, great. But I can guarantee you one thing, I'm not letting the old dude in the suit push me over. I can tell you that much. So I'm just sitting there going, Holy Spirit, if you want this for me, then great. If not, I ain't doing it. I'm not giving in to the peer pressure. My mama told me about jumping off the cliffs. Uh Uh-uh. So I was in this type of exposure. And then I began to pastor more deeply in in these veins, in these churches. And I began to see some authentic times of when God was truly showing up and seeing when Holy Spirit would truly do things of this nature. And, and I knew that it was authentic. My spirit was testifying with what was happening. This was authentic. But I also saw a lot of times when it wasn't. And the sad part is, is I saw far more times that it was not authentic than what I saw when it was. And that's hard to reconcile in your mind, isn't it? I mean, have you ever been there in a a situation like that, that you're like seeing something that you know scripturally, you know scripturally, it talks about it, but yet there's something happening there that's just disingenuous. Like, right, it's just not, you're, you're just not testifying with it. You're not connecting with it. You, you can't reconcile it. So we begin, I, you know, I begin praying to God. God, I, I, you, I need you to show me some things. I need you to help me make sense of some things. Sorry, I'm, I've, never, I've never shared this, like, publicly before this, this journey, okay? So just bear with me. So I find myself at another conference, and it's a women's conference, and I was playing on the praise team, okay? I was like, I didn't just wonder, it was like, here I am, oddball again, hi. Now, so, like the last night of the conference, like, as we're, you know, doing the sound checks and everything, I see, I see this lady roll in in a wheelchair, okay? She comes in, and she's right here. Stage right, right up front. And yeah, we do the thing. We go praise and worship the message, and then there's the altar call. And I mean, they're doing the Pentecostal thing. And I mean, it's just like, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's Pentecostal. And I'm sitting up there going. But then everything's done. I'm packing up my gear, and I'm walking out. And I noticed that this lady who came in in a wheelchair ro- rolled out the exact same way. And then I overheard someone saying, my goodness, we had church in here tonight. Like, God showed up in a mighty way in this place. And there was something in my mind that just triggered. I was just like, I don't know about that. Because my experience at that point, for the most part, had been seeing in this type of atmosphere, seeing the well touched And the people who were afflicted, whether it be in their body, in their mind, in their emotions, in their mental, in in these, in the spiritual realm, in these things in life, I, I just, I was like, I don't know about that because I just saw somebody who came in who needed a touch from God and she left the same way that she, she came in here. And I don't know how we can, how we can stand and say how we've experienced such a mighty thing. And I went back to the room that I was staying in, and I remember just getting on my face in front of the Lord, and I just, I prayed this prayer. And I said, God, I love you. I'm never, ever, ever going to turn away from you. This is not what this is about. I love you with everything that's in me. But if that's all there is, if that's what the pinnacle of church is, to see the well being touched and the afflicted leaving the same way that they came, I don't want that anymore. Like, that's not the Jesus that I read about in the New Testament. Amen? I mean, the people, I mean, I, I want to see people who need a touch from Jesus get a touch from Jesus. 
regardless of whether that's something like super flamboyant or if it's just in that still small voice. Y'all ever been there? You know, those moments that nobody else knows about, but you can just feel the presence of the Lord working inside of you and he touches you in the area that you need for him to intervene. And I, I don't know if it was in my head what, but it wasn't a voice that was mine. I can tell you that much. It wasn't my voice. I just hear this inside of me that says, good, I've got some things I want to show you. So here I had just laid myself bare to say, listen, if this is all that there is, I don't want it. Like if this is the pinnacle of it, I don't want it anymore. I love you, never going to turn my back from you, but if this is it, I don't want it. So then God began to take me on a greater depth in that journey because what I'd found myself is I had been raised and rooted in this sufficiency and sovereignty of God's word and scripture and now I'm, I'm in this place to where they, they still believe in God's word but it seems like the, they're, they're more focused on the sufficiency of the experience that they can have. Like the emotional experience. Those things that tangibly we can feel, those, those manifestations that, that we can experience somehow with our senses, those were being elevated far above what the sufficiency of Scripture was. And I was like, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, something's not right here. And actually, one of the questions, as I was interviewing back here in 2014, before the actual official interview took place. I came in and talked with the elders, and one of the questions was, is like, what do you value more, God's Word or an experience with God? And my answer was, I don't know how you can separate the two. Because God's Word should always lead you into an experience with God, and any experience that you have with God should be able to be backed up in God's Word. Amen? So how do you separate the two? And then, in 2013, this book hit my hands. It's called Holy Fire by R.T. Kendall. This is the man who played a part in our wedding back in 1998. Some of my wife's family pastored in England for several years. And this book hit my hand, and I want to read you just one page from that, this book this morning. He calls this the silent divorce. There has been a silent divorce in the church, speaking generally, between the Word and the Spirit. When there is a divorce, sometimes the children stay with the mother, sometimes with the father. In this divorce, you have those on the Word side and those on the Spirit side. What's the difference? Those on the word side stress earnestly contending for the faith once delivered to the saints. Expository preaching, sound theology, rediscovering the doctrines of the Reformation, justif justification by faith, and the sovereignty of God. And until we get back to the word, the honor of God's name will not be restored. Now what's wrong with this emphasis? Nothing. It's exactly right in my opinion. Those on the spirit side stress getting back to the book of Acts. Signs, wonders, and miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit, with places being shaken at prayer meetings. Get in Peter's shadow, and you're healed. Lie to the Holy Spirit, and you're struck dead. Until we recover the power of the Spirit, the honor of God's name will not be restored. Now, what is wrong with this emphasis? Nothing. It's exactly right, in my opinion. The problem is, neither side will learn from the other. But if these two would come together, the simultaneous combustion would mean spontaneous, or the sponta simultaneous combination would mean spontaneous combustion. So that's how I want us to look at the gifts of the Spirit very quickly this morning, because I told you my journey to tell you this, to make this point, 
God, back in 1998, in his sovereignty, put a man into my life that I'd never met, never spoken to before, knowing that years down the road, I was going to be at a place where I was trying to reconcile God's Word and God's Spirit because they were emphasized on two totally different uh, paradigms and two totally different extremes in my world. He introduced me to a man that provided the language that brought the two together for me. And I believe that I stand here in front of you today, almost 10 years to the day after getting that book and finding my voice for my theology of, hey, I believe in the sovereignty and the sufficiency of God's Word, but I also see the Holy Spirit playing out in the New Testament, but I've not seen that in our time when the two come together. And that's what I believe the heart of God is for FCC in this season. I, I put a goal up here. I want to read this to you. It's wordy. I understand that. Then I'm going to explain it. Then we'll get to 1 Corinthians. FCC wants to be about robust doctrinal purity rooted in the sufficiency of God's Word while embracing the sufficiency of Scripture as the Scriptures reveal to us that the gifts of God are available to His church to this day for the same purposes they were given in the first century. So basically what that's saying is, is our goal is to take the sufficiency of His Word and the power of His Holy Spirit operating in our lives and put the two together and operate from that place as a church. Amen? Does that sound okay to everybody? Okay, that was not confidence building at all. All right, so I'm going to ask that question when I get to the end of my message because you're just like, I maybe I want to hear what you have to say. I'm not going to lie, I'm kind of intrigued. Where are you going? So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, you'll see in your Bibles that it may be italicized. The word gifts may be italicized in there, if it is. The reason being is because the word gifts was not in the original text. It would have read, now concerning the spiritual Which makes sense because for the first 11 chapters, Paul has been addressing the fleshly things. Like the church at Corinth right here was a train wreck. And they thought that they were amazing at two things, spiritual gifts and the grace of God. Paul writes them two letters and tells them, you're terrible at two things. You want to know what they are? Spiritual gifts and the grace of God. So he's led up to this, talking about the carnal, the way that the flesh is playing out. And then he makes this transition now concerning the spiritual So the spiritual gifts. I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, capital S, Spirit, Holy Spirit right here. All types of different gifts, one Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them in everyone. If you ever want another evidence of Trinity, the Trinitarian belief, these past three verses right here do that, 4, 5, and 6. Verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. Could, Could anybody use some more wisdom in here? Okay, wisdom? Okay, good. And another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. How about knowledge? Anybody else use some knowledge? Okay, good, good. Another, faith. Anybody use a little bit more faith? Okay, stay with me, stay with me. Okay. And another, gifts of healing. Right? Right? A lot of sick people, man. Another, the working of miracles. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Another, prophecy. Prophecy, just declaring the word of God boldly, right? Yeah, we're good. We're on. The ability to distinguish between spirits, the discernment. How many of you could use more discernment in your life? Me? Okay. Hands are getting less, but that's fine. Then we get here. And to another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are empowered by one and the same spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. 
Now, I can't say this 100%, but Paul usually, when he makes lists, he writes them in order of what he feels is more significant than the rest of the list. So what does Paul lead off with in this list of spiritual gifts here? Wisdom. What does he finish with? Tongues. He's not denying that tongues is a gift. I just don't think he's presenting it as the pinnacle. But yet the exposure that we, most of us have had to the gifts of the Spirit, what's the first thing you think of? Right? It's like somebody, yeah, it's like somebody pointing at their shoe real fast going, heal my shoe. You know, I mean, it's like they're, we think about tongues. And here's the reason behind that. And I'm going to make this statement. And I, I don't think we're ever going to be put in a place where we have to make the decision. But I had, it, I had the question posed to me one time. If you had to choose, you had no option. You had to choose between the fruit of the Spirit, which we covered last week, and the gifts of the Spirit, which would you choose? And my answer was 100% fruit of the Spirit. Because I believe it's the fruit of the Spirit that reveals the character of God in our life. I believe the gifts of the Spirit are things that God gives us to help us along the way. 100%. I don't think we're ever going to have to choose, but I just want you to know my stance, okay? If we ever, if your pastor ever has to choose if FCC is going to be a fruit of the Spirit or a gifts of the Spirit church, fruit of the Spirit every day, twice on Sunday. But we've got this list, right? And these are the gifts. It makes us uncomfortable in some ways, doesn't it? At least it does me. And I've had a pretty good deal of exposure to these things. And I'm still, still uncomfortable. They're still awkward. But when you look at what God gives us, you have to understand that these are gifts that he gives. Romans 11.20, there is a responsibility that each and every one of us have. Because each and every one of us are gifted by God. If you're here, you call Jesus your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells within you, then you are gifted. Amen? Okay, stay with me. We're all gifted. There is a responsibility that comes with that. Romans 11.29 tells us, I believe, yeah, let me look at that, I remembered. What about that? 11.29 tells us that the giftings of God or without repentance. The gifting and the calling of God is, it's irrevocable. He's not going to take them back. So let's just be honest in here. How many of us have ever rolled across, either on YouTube, social media, or on TV, we've rolled across the televangelist? Right? Now listen, I'm not trying to clump all of them because I believe there's some genuine brothers and sisters out there who are doing things on a far grander scale than what I am that are incredibly genuine with what they're doing. But I think the majority of them, I don't think t putting your hand on your phone, computer, or TV screen is going to do much. I don't think that sending $1,000 in to put your name on a brick in their new building is doing anything other than taking money from you. And we see these gifts of the Spirit. We hear these tongues. We see people falling out under the power of the Spirit. And we feel the disingenuous nature of what we're seeing. And we begin to build a wall against these things. Because, number one, we don't understand it. And number two, the exposure we're having to it just seems incredibly fake. Like, that dude's a charlatan. I can promise you that. You know, you get that feeling. Any, anybody, am I speaking to myself here? Good. Good. We have a responsibility to steward the gifts that God gives us because he will not take them back. That's Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. I give you, God gives us gifts, and he gives us callings. And he does them without repentance, which means that he does not change his mind. Which the scary part of that is, means that 
we have a responsibility to steward them well. And that means that sometimes people abuse the spiritual gifts that they've been given. The gifts of the Spirit that God has given to people, there are times when people abuse them and operate from the flesh instead of operating from the Spirit. And when we see these things that we've maybe never experienced, we've never had exposure to, and we're seeing them, and they're done so out of someone who's abusing a gifting, abusing a calling that God has placed on their lives, most of the time we immediately jump to the fact of, that's not of God. That's not real. That's not a thing. When we see in Scripture, it very much is a thing. It may just not look anything like what we've seen or what we're currently seeing. So we have to understand that we have a responsibility with the gifting of Holy Spirit that God has given us, but we also have to remember the source of the gifting. The source of the gift is not you and I. There's nothing that you're doing that's causing this gift to operate. You're not the one who conjures it up. Deuteronomy 8.18 says that it is God who gives us everything we need to be successful. That we understand that God is the one who places these things in our lives. We also see in God's word that he is the giver of all good and perfect gifts, right? Amen? Amen. God is the giver of all good and perfect gifts. They're good and they're perfect. Each and every one of them are good and perfect. The problem becomes his good, perfect, infallible gifts get deposited into this not real good, not real perfect, completely fallible vessel that is called me, and it has to filter through there. So sometimes these good, perfect, Holy Spirit-given gifts are not stewarded well, and they come through this flesh and through this sin nature that we have, and we see the wrong versions of them. And therefore, it's really tempting for us to just block it out and say, oh, that's not real. Oh, that's not really a thing. That's, 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 that's not biblical. Well, that, that was just for them. That was just for that time. You know, and there's, there's lines of theology that I don't have time to get into, but I want us to understand something. We have been called in Scripture to eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Paul goes on to talk in Romans 12, or not Romans, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 12, which we read out of, and then he talks again in 1 Corinthians 14 about the gifts of Holy Spirit, and he says to eagerly desire them. And I don't know if we're at a place where we would look at that list that I read to us earlier from verses 1 through 11 in 1 Corinthians 12, and we'd go, I eagerly desire all of those. But he says to eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. And here's the thing. Before I close, I want to throw out this. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, deal with gifts of the Spirit. But you want to know something? Neither one of those passages are really about gifts of the Spirit. What it's really about is found in chapter 13. Anybody have a guess as to what 1 Corinthians 13 is? The love chapter, right? I was like, you hear it at every wedding ever. Love is patient, love is kind, love is kind. That's what it's about. Paul's saying is like, listen, these gifts of the Spirit, they're real. But if you do them without love, it doesn't matter. It's about love. It's about you and I loving Jesus Christ. It's about us operating the way that he wants us to operate. To have his Holy Spirit dwelling in us, gifting us, leading us, showing us what we need to be doing out of love for a lost and dying world. 
It's not about puffing ourselves up. It's not about look at me. It's not about look how spiritual I am or you don't have the Holy Spirit if you don't do this thing. No, it's about God saying, I want you to love the world so well and I'm going to give you gifts in order that you can do that even better so that they know that it's actually me that you are speaking on behalf of because if you're doing it of yourself, you're a clanging brass or a ringing cymbal. So what's the problem with spiritual gifts that we have so much? The problem is most of the time we take it out of the context of love. And we put it in the context of our flesh. Of like, it's all about me. And it's not. God gives you gifts so that you can serve him better so that you can reach a lost and dying world, so you can reach those family members better than what you are now. You can reach your neighbors that don't know the Lord better than what you ever have before. It is through Holy Spirit's leading and His giftings that we live successfully unto the Lord, as Deuteronomy 8.18 says. So don't, as we talk about gifts of the Spirit, this week as you go through thinking about gifts of the Spirit, don't get caught up in what some people call charismania. All right? Don't let that type of stuff scare you. All right? Because it's not about the gifts. It's about love. It's not about what I do. It's about who I touch. It's not about who I am. It's about whose I am. You see, everything has to point back to Jesus Christ. I want to ask the praise team if they would to come back up. I'm also, here's how I'm going to close. I'm going to present to you kind of a a little bit of a dangerous prayer that I'm going to encourage you to pray this week. Because here's, here's the problem that we have. We really like to be comfortable. Amen? I, I, I love comfort. I have multiple recliners at my house because I don't want to have to go to a specific room. If I'm in this room and I want to be comfortable, I don't want to have to walk all the way in there. I'll sit down right. We love comfort, and we don't like things that we don't understand, and we don't like things that make us uncomfortable. And I'm going to ask you to pray for both of them this week. So here's the prayer, the challenge. To eagerly desire, and this is the prayer, God, we don't care what it looks like as long as it looks like you. We don't care what it looks like as long as it looks like you. Again, Holy Spirit, if you want to do it, I'm all in for it. But it better be Holy Spirit. (laughs) So I challenge you. Because we have this problem that if something comes along in our life that somebody says is of God and we don't understand it or we're not comfortable with it, you may have heard this statement because I know you've never ever said it. Well, that's just not God. Be careful when you make that statement because what you're saying is is that you have God all figured out and you know exactly how he works and what he does. So I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me as, as I close my message here this morning, get ready to turn it over to the praise team. So I'm just going to ask you, let's all read this together, okay? God, we don't care what it looks like as long as it looks like you. And pray that prayer throughout this week in your life. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've never responded to his call on your heart to surrender your life to him, I would encourage you to do so this morning. If you're here today and maybe you're struggling, you're a believer, maybe there's some things in your life that you feel like God is leading you into, but you may not be completely comfortable with them and you don't know if it's God, if it's Holy Spirit leading you into that, you're asking him to give you clarity, then I would encourage you to come forward this morning. I'm going to ask the people that that are on our prayer team this morning to go ahead and to come on up, and I would ask you to respond to God's calling on your heart as we stand and as we sing this morning.
Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Mike if he would to come up. Um, everybody, most of you know this, but this is Micah Adams. Uh, yeah, everybody say hi, Micah. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Micah has come to officially place his membership here in the First Church family. He's been with us for a while now, serving, uh, doing great things here at the church. He is already a baptized believer, but he has come today to officially put his membership in. So I'm just going to ask you to repeat this after me, please. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ the, Son of the, living God. the Son of the living God. Welcome to the family, young man. Proud of you, buddy. Okay, uh, I have a few announcements real quick uh, before we close. Um, firstly, this evening, all the things are happening. So The Chosen is happening in here. Make sure you come along to that if you're an adult. Uh, kids and youth are in the other buildings. So especially if you're a parent and you're dropping off your kids, pop over here and, and uh, join in watching The Chosen and, and join in the discussion um, that's happening this evening. And the senior ministry lunch uh, is happening on May 2nd at KCU's cafeteria at 11.30 a.m. Um, so senior ministry lunch, May 2nd at KCU. Um, after service today, there's a couple of things happening. So there are photos happening. This is, I think this is the last week that we're doing photos. So if you haven't had your photo done yet for the directory, that is happening in the, uh, the room back here. Is that the choir room? Is that what that's called? Choir room happening back there um, straight after service. The other thing after service is a Sunday school meeting, um, which is happening just up front here. So if you need to do both, uh, make sure you just come up. Hop in, uh, Britt is having a meeting here for 10 minutes uh, after service, and then go get your photo taken for the directory. Um, last couple of things uh, are youth-related. So uh, firstly, our Wednesday afternoon program has been going really well. We have, last week we had 68 kids. It was just wild. Uh, it was, there was way too many. Um, no, it was great, but we need more adults. Uh, we really need help um, because it's been a fantastic ministry opportunity, and we have many who are coming to our Wednesday program who want to come to our Sunday evening programs, but have no way of getting there. So one of the main needs that we really have it, are people who are willing to drive uh, and drive our church van and transport kids home, uh, and then also start discussions about maybe transporting them to our Sunday evening programs as well, uh, and making that a possibility. Um, so please chat to me uh, if you're willing to help uh, on Wednesday afternoons. We need at least one to ten kids, um, and we are barely at that right now. So if we keep increasing in size, we're, we really need your help. Um, so that is happening. Last thing, uh, Empower is happening this summer. It is happening on the first-ish uh, week of June, the 4th through the 9th, um, starting that Sunday. We are doing all of the sign-up online, uh, and we have a cut-off date at the end of May. Make sure you hop online and get signed up ASAP um, so that we can make all of the arrangements needed. Um, everything's happening at KCU this year. Um, we're really excited about um, where it's going this year. So please, if you have not signed up online, make sure you get signed up online immediately. Uh, and that'll all be, we'll put more posts on the Facebook page and, and, and links to that. Um, so make sure you get that done. I don't know if I've forgotten anything. I think that's everything. Uh, if that's the case, I'm going to pray. And then uh, you guys are dismissed. Father, thank you for another wonderful opportunity to get together and talk about how you move in our lives. Lord, we continue to pray that prayer that, um, that Ben shared with us, um, that we, we don't care what it looks like, we just want more of you, Lord, and we just want um, to take you out into the mission field as we leave this place today. Thank you for today's message. Thank you for everyone here who's here to hear it, uh, and I pray that you inspire all of us to carry you into our day today. In your name we pray. Amen.